Good evening. My name is John Grove. I'm the pastor here at Columbus Baptist Church. And on behalf of the whole family, I'm sure I speak for them when I say thank you all for being here this evening. You're not just a crowd to, these, to this dear family. Each one of you individually really counts, and they will never forget who is here this evening. So thank you for your comfort by just being here and the words that you speak. What we're going to do this evening as we remember Steve and thank God for his life, we're going to sing a few songs. We're going to have a time of sharing. And uh, so I'd like to just get your minds thinking about that. If you knew Steve and uh, you have a, a favorite memory or something about him that would make you smile, uh, some way God perhaps blessed you through his life, we would love it if you would take a moment to share that with us. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Dear God, right now, I pray in Jesus' name that you will, and I know you will, be here in this room in a special way. You say when we gather together for the purpose of Jesus Christ, Jesus is there. May we feel your comfort and presence tonight. May you speak truth to us. And may you do this amazing miracle, which you promise, and that is to bring good out of everything for those who love you. So thank you, God, for how you will work in our hearts and help us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing two songs together?
eyes will see when your face is before me. feel led to share this brief scripture, and then I will invite Marlon to come forward. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it speaks about what is coming in the future, and about our well-founded hope of seeing our loved ones in Christ again. It says, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant or unknowing about those who fall asleep. That's the New Testament way of speaking about when a Christian dies. The body goes to sleep. The soul immediately goes into the presence of the Lord. But he goes on to say, I don't want you to be ignorant about what happens to those who fall asleep. He says, and it's not necessary for us to grieve like the rest of mankind when they go through their deaths. Because we believe that Jesus died, but that he also rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him, that is, believing in him with a sincere faith. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left here, we will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord and each other forever. Therefore, have hope. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Heavenly Father, we dedicate this time to you. We ask you, Father, to speak 
in your word and in your spirit and through us to one another. As we celebrate Steve's life, as we comfort one another at this temporary goodbye, and as we, Father, grow closer to you and know how to live in righteousness, peace, and joy. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Marlon, welcome, my brother. Please come forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um, we're we're kind of solemn at the moment, so I'd, I'd like to lighten the mood in the ways that we can lighten the mood. First of all, um, I really thank everyone for coming out, being together to um, remember Steve and to honor his memory. It's a blessing to see all of you here. Um, so for those of you who um, not just are coming out to support the family, but knew Steve, you probably think that Steve is going to pop out from behind that curtain or something like that because Steve is the type of person that would put all this together just to get us all to come out and pay attention to him. That was Steve. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't think he's going to pop out from behind the curtain on this one. But the blessing to have known Steve and all the energy he was and all the happiness um, that Steve could be is just, it's an awesome, awesome thing. I'm going to keep this part brief. But I want to tell you how, um, how we all ended up in this room together. So uh, my ex first experience with Steve was at Ewing Residential Treatment Center, um, where he was and I was mentoring um, another one of my sons there. And he was coming home on the weekends, Kenny that is. And Kenny said, uh, I got a friend that I want to bring home with me on the weekends. And I'm like, listen, I got three people living with me now, and, uh, and I'm not sure if the fourth teenager is going to be a good thing. And Kenny said, it's not going to be a good thing, but you're going to have to bring Steve home. And so um, Steve came home and became a part of our family. We are kind of a, um, we're like a grafted in branch, um, grafted in branches into a tree, um, the Webb family. We are an adopted in family. There are so many of us, I can't even tell you. Um, some of us are legally adopted in, some are adopted um, just by love, but we are, we are a connected family. And so Steve was a, Steve was a part of that family. Um, so let me back up to two weeks ago. I get a phone call from Steve, and Steve is talking to me about um, just wanting to apologize for things that have happened in life. And I'm like, all right, Steve, will you apologize for some stuff that happened back in, I don't know, 20 years ago? I'm not paying any attention to that stuff. But Steve just starts talking to me. And he's like, listen, listen, Dad, I want to tell you. All right, listen, I'm sorry for when I did this. I'm sorry for when I did that. I'm sorry for when I did it. I'm like, I didn't know you did that. He's like, just, just wait. Let me get to the end. <laughs> I'm sorry for when I did this and this and this and this. And he goes on and on and on. Um, and I was blessed to hear it. But I was only really listening with one ear because I wasn't caught up on those things. Um, and I said, all right, Steve, well, so what's next? Like, what are you going to do? Now, my sons will tell you, in a conversation, my most common thing to say to them is, so what are you going to do about it? Like, what are you, we're talking about it. You, you got ideas. What are you going to do? So I say to Steve, what are you going to do? Steve says, um, Dad, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to make it work with Emily. He says, I'm going to work that out. And he says, and I am going to love Jesus. I said, all right, Steve, um, so what does that mean? I'm, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to live for Jesus. And that, he's shaking his head and doing this thing where he looks up in the corners as he's talking to me. And, <laughs> and I was on the phone. I could just assume that's what he was doing. Um, but that was such a blessing for me, right? Because that's the last time I talked to Steve. And, man, for me to know that there's a God that loves me enough that for the last conversation that I have with Steve, that it's a blessing and I know where we stand. Um, I know that he loved me, I know I loved him, and I know we both knew that. And so that was an awesome thing. Um, so, because I want other people to get to speak, and I could talk this all day, um, I would like to show you something that is near and dear to my heart, just so you know a little bit about the side of Steve that maybe he would show or maybe he wouldn't. But um, a couple years ago, me and AJ and Kenny took a ride down to um, see Steve because Steve said that he wanted us to come down for something that he had going on at church. And if, Lee, if we have that available now, can we play that? Hello, church. My name is Stephen Bogle, 
pastor wanted me to explain why God and has always will have an impact on my life. The reason God has an impact on my life is because the great friends and family he has provided for me to serve for him. I'm ready to put on my armor and fight for the Lord with the word. I can no longer live a double life. Another reason I believe God has an impact on my life is for all the blessings that I have received that I did not know were his. I can go on and on about how God has an impact on my life. Just watch and see God's work. Thank you and God bless. Steve, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Absolutely. And you renounce the devil's sin and all the works of darkness? All right, then according to the profession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Into the so that's, that is the literal Steve behind the curtain. So if you knew him, we're going to keep it real. Steve had some troubles. He had some stuff that he dealt with, right? Um, and what I'd like you to know about Steve is Steve's troubles are just like the troubles we're all dealing with. Now, we have a different variety, maybe, but some of us are wearing our troubles on the outside, like Steve. He couldn't put those troubles on the inside for nobody if he was trying to, but that's, that's what Steve was going through. And some of us get to live with those troubles on the inside, but I... I can tell you that we're all troubled and all in the need of a savior, all in the need of someone to be able to um, stand in the gap for our troubled lives and the things that we have going on in our lives. And so just in case you didn't know the Steve behind the curtain, that's the Steve behind the curtain. Steve loved the Lord and Steve loved people. And sometimes it was hard for him to love people. Sometimes he was so broken that he had to focus on himself. And sometimes you would see some anger. Sometimes you would see and experience that brokenness. But trust and believe that was the Steve behind the curtain. Um, so before I go on and on, um, Steve always asked me to go fishing with him. Always. I don't like no bit of fishing. If you know me, you know I'm not about too much outdoor stuff. I'm, I'm going to keep it real with you. I'm from the hood, and I'm not going into the woods. I'm just not doing it. That's not how I roll. You'll, if you know me, you know this about me. Steve's always trying to, hey, hey let's go. We're, we're going to get on some quads, and we're going to go into the woods. No, we were going to get on quads, but we weren't going into the woods. We're going to get in a boat, and we're going we're gonna to get in a boat, but I'm not fishing. That's just not what I do. So this is the picture that, that I chose to put up um, to remember Steve. And so I want you to understand this. Uh, you see that water there in the background? And you see Steve, who we know was a broken person who accepted a Savior to love him and help him to be healed. Um, I want you to know for the people around you who might be living with that much brokenness on the inside, um, and you might think it's there, see it's there, not be sure, not sure if you want to reach out to that person, I want you to know that the sound of somebody drowning right next to you is silence. See, when people drown, you can't hear it. It doesn't sound like people yelling for help. They got water in their lungs. They can't, they can't yell for your help. But if you look to the right, you look to the left, you'll see the person that was around you and you'll see the peril that they're in. And for all the things that Steve had going on on the outside and however hard it was to look at where he was and who he was, he needed that kind of love. So just remember that. I didn't go fishing with Steve in life. I didn't. And I don't regret that I didn't go fishing with Steve in life. I still don't like fishing. Um, but I'm going to tell you that I serve a Savior who said... Um, that he was going to make the people who followed him, who loved like him, who loved with him on their journey, he was going to make them fishermen of men. So I can tell you now that me and Steve are about to go fishing. And we're going to fish for men. We're going to fish for people who are brokenhearted and hurting, and we're going to love them. And that's what the Webb family's always done, and that's what we're about to do. So you'll be able to see that. And you can join us in that trip at any time, in any way. We got people for you to love on if you don't have any around you, but you got people to the right, to the left of you who need that kind of love. So see past the brokenness, because we're all broken. See past what they're displaying on the outside, because they all have that going on. We all have that going on. I'm speaking for me, can't really speak for you, but I'm gonna tell you, we all got it going on. Listen, love the people around you. They need that kind of love. Steve needed that kind of love, and he would give that kind of love. So we're about to go fishing for some men. I love you all and thank you. I'll talk to you again. And so my friends, we'd, we'd like to take a little bit of time to hear from some of you uh, a, a memory or something you appreciated or something that you loved about Steve and uh, 
you might feel kind of nervous because you're not used to speaking in front of people. Well, we're just everyday people here. We don't have to make any kind of impression at all. But if you have something that you would like to share, please just kind of make your way up here to the front. The reason I'm asking you to come to the front, we're recording everything. Uh, and this way you can be heard in the room and for the recording. So who would like to get the ball rolling and say something at all? Huh? Okay, yes. Good, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Gene Webb. I'm Marlon's dad. Um, Steve will be missed. We're a Christian family, so we understand brokenness, and all families have brokenness. The world is broken, and the lack of compassion in the world one for another is why we have so much trauma, evil, wars, and hatred towards one another. The only cure is the love of God. And we as Christians strive to, to abide in that cure, to love any and everyone under any conditions because we've experienced it, um, especially minorities. But we come out of it a better people, loving one another, loving America, loving all of our brothers and sisters. Steve was special. He had a love, and that's all he wanted. He just wanted people to love him. And, and it was so sad that the number was three and he couldn't get to four because that's all Steve wanted. So he was in and out. And, and I think personally, um, Marlon's testament to his sons and daughters about the Lord, Steve sought the Lord finally. And I personally, spiritually, think that God's compassion on Steve seeing him go in and out of all of these traumas and then get back home and then get back into the trauma, had mercy on Steve and gave him the love that Steve was truly looking for. Because the love we all are truly looking for is the love of God. So sometimes God will call his children home to give them that love when he sees that they're just going to keep suffering in the world. So my joy is that Marlon has brought all of his children to the foot of the cross, to love the Lord, to serve the Lord, to testify of the love of God, and it has blessed all of them. And I know it has blessed everyone here because you're all of the faith. So I would say in honor of Steve, keep that eye and ear and mind and heart of compassion to remember that you may see a person dressed in the best suit, yet they're broken inside. They're hurting inside. And that is the relationship we as Christians are supposed to have and share with them. If they're broken, let them lean on you. Let them, we are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keepers to the glory of God. The strong carry the infirmities of the weak. And we sometimes get frustrated and we become insensitive to one another. And that's just the flesh. And we all have it and we all do it. But our challenge is to really try to serve the Lord and the love. Steve gave all of us so much love. He, he, was, he was one of four teenagers, and I love all the teenagers. But my boys here, <laughs> they, they come up on the rough side of the mountain. <laughs> yes, they do, but so did my family. It was a testament to our family. Um, Steve didn't come up on the rough side of the mountain. He came up on the gentle side of the mountain, and that's how he was, and I loved him always for it. Um, so I just thank God for the opportunity to meet him, fellowship with him, love him, and to be blessedly assured that where he is now is the best place anyone can be and the same place we're all striving to be in heaven with the Lord. Great job, Marlon. Oh, before I forget, Jen, thank you. Thank you. Because I couldn't understand a woman dealing with all the kids that Marlon brought home. I'm, truly, truly, I mean, seriously. And, and they weren't necessarily the best kids. They were kids. But you stood by his side, ah, like everything was perfect. You know? And, and I thank you so much. I love you so much for it. Yes.
Uh, my name is uh, Patrick. A lot of you may not know me. Um, I met Stephen when I was a small child. Me, him, and a good friend Dan of mine. Kenny, right here. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we all uh, grew up together in a program. And, uh, uh, I'm, I apologize. Um, Steve had a pretty rough life, I'd say, coming up. Uh, for those of you who know him, what had happened with his mother, um, Marlon, he uh, took him into his own Kenny as well. Um, thank you. Um, when we got out of the program together, uh, my mother actually took Steve into our home with us because he had nowhere to stay any longer as an adult. So uh, he lived in my mother's house under a roof where she clothed him, fed him, and roofed him like he was one of her kids. So it was natural that together we were such a bond that he was a brother to me, more than just a friend. He always put a smile on, no matter what the situation was. I'd just like to say thank you and uh, God bless. Hi guys, my name's Emily. Um, Steve is really special to me. Um, I don't think I could ever find another one like him if I tried for my whole life. And the thing with Steve was, he always used to tell me that he's not going to talk about it, he's just going to do it. And a lot of people say that. And he proved to me time after time that he would just say something to me, he would just say, I love you, I'm going to do this. He would just do it. <laughs> just not expect anything for it. And some people thought he was like a rough and like tumble guy. And once you got to know him, that kid would give you the shirt off his back and do anything for you. <laughs> if he loved you, he loved you till the end. I'm sorry, I, just, I don't even, I don't even know what I wanted to say right now, but let's take the gist of it. Thank you. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Billy. I was uh, Steve's friend. Uh, cool guy. Funniest guy in know. He would always know what to say. Uh, any situation. Any situation. He just got, he got the, uh, what was it, the Yamaha R1. And, uh, he's like, you want to go for a ride? Come over. We're going to go ride it right now. I said, all right, let's go, Steve. Came over, riding it. He's out there, 7 o'clock in the morning, revving the engine out front. He's like, oh, I'm warming it up. So I go ride the bike, come back. Freaking cop looks at me. He says, come here. What are you doing? He says, he says you're going past the church revving the engine. I said, no, it wasn't me. He says, I said, who was it? I didn't snitch him out. I said, he says, it's not my bike, sir. So the cop followed me back. Steve comes out. He said, what's going on? And uh, he's like, oh, I was just switching gears. I was trying to, trying to find the gear. He always knew what to say. It was great. I wouldn't. I would, <laughs> funny guy. Great guy. We'd always go skiing. Let's go up upstate New York right now. Let's go. But love the man. And uh, this is a great place. And it's awesome you guys put it together. Thank you. My name is Megan. I've known Steve for probably six, seven years. And it's kind of funny how you guys were saying he, you know, would give the shirt off his back or he was broken. 
Um, too emotional, sorry. Sorry. I knew I was going to cry. <laughs> I, I can't. But I want to say it because he really was that way. And when I met him, I was broken. And I had just went through literally almost losing my life. And I had moved to Highlands into a house, uh, renting a room to just get away from my old life. And... Some of my family didn't even know where I was, but I felt safe there. And he actually worked for um, the person that rented the room out. They were lifting houses and, and doing construction and things. Um, and I would always stay in my room and I never knew what depression was until I actually went through that. And I would just go to work and then go home and be in my room and I didn't hang out. I just did that every day. <laughs> And one day, I woke up and there was a note on the floor. Like, he put it under the door just to say, hey, you don't have to stay in that room all the time, you know. You could have friends if you want. We can go out somewhere. And left his number with a smiley face on his name. And I was like, what the hell? I've never, I mean, heck, I have never seen anything like that in my life. And uh, so I, I did text him, and I said, is this Steve? And he said, yes. And I was like, you know, I don't want a boyfriend or anything, but maybe I'll come out. We can get a drink, or we can do something. And he's like, yeah, I just want to be your friend. And he really was the best friend for so long after that. And he was crazy, crazy too, <laughs> funny and crazy. Uh, he actually befriended my husband as well, um, years later and they would I'd come home from work and they'd be gone on the trails quadding doing whatever and um they became so close to so it was just a blessing um for me when I really needed someone he was definitely such a good friend and he never he never changed from being that way so um that's really it but he was incredible How's everybody doing? My name is Larry Paul. I'm uh, actually Marlon's younger cousin. I came up to talk because uh, I honestly haven't seen Steven in 15 years. And uh, I'm listening to everybody come up and talk and things like that. And um, you guys are giving great stories and things. But I want you guys to understand it. The reason why I'm as close to AJ and Kenny and Dave right now is, is because we really were troubled kids. We, we were a problem. Um, Marlon's father and my mother are brother and sister, so he didn't have to let me come over and hang out with him as much, but he's seen the same things in me that we've seen in them. And when I tell you it was rough, we broke things that we couldn't pay for. We, we oh my gosh, we helped each other get in trouble. I mean, but those are the things that we, we remember when we get to this point. I remember a time when I was first moving into my first apartment, I didn't have a car, right? And so I call AJ and I'm like, AJ, this is, I have to be out and I need, I need a way to move, to move my stuff out. He said, all right, I got a truck, but it's not mine's. <laughs> and I'm like, whose truck is it? It's Pop's truck. I was like, we gotta take that risk. <laughs> so I drove over to AJ's house and we got Pops' truck without permission and we went and moved my stuff and about six hours later, Pops is calling me, Larry Paul, where is my truck? I'm like, I fell asleep on, but I'm going to bring it to you right now, I got you. But these are the types of stories we had for days from sneaking out to helping each other get back in, to helping each other in fights and things like that and that's just... That's the family that we have. That's the, that's the love that we grew up out of and now we turned into grown men, you know? And it's a, it's a blessing being able to see these guys here and I, I wish it was under different circumstances, but I want everybody to understand it's not just about the good times, it's just about the times, you know? It's just about being there. As again, I haven't seen them in 15 years but I'm here because when I did see him, he left an impression on me and I wanted to come and show that side. 
All right, so I appreciate everybody for listening to my words. And like Marlon said, thank all of you for being here. Hello, I'm uh, Stephen's Aunt Lori. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to tell kind of a funny story. The kid used to like make me a nervous wreck. He was, he was crazy and wild. And I remember when he was in the Ewing facility, I would go and visit him on, sometimes on the weekends. And he was only 16 and he had his permit. <laughs> and he gets in the car, he's like, Aunt Lori, can I drive Aunt Lori? Come on, Aunt Lori, let me drive. Come on, let me drive, Aunt Lori. I'm like, all right, Steve, and go ahead, you can drive. My heart was in my throat. He drove like a Mario Andretti. <laughs> Scared the living daylights at me. He's like, it's all right, Aunt Lori, I got it, I got it, no problem, you know. He just, he was uh, full of life, a little crazy kid, definitely loving. I, um, I would, we would, you know, we'd go out for the day or whatever, give him to this store, foreman store or something, and we would, you know, buy just a piece of clothing or something. I remember he made me buy these sneakers that were probably like size 11, and he was an 8 or something. He's like, no, they fit me, Aunt Lori. I like them. I like them. They fit me, you know. But um, I haven't seen him now. I saw him when he was in the hospital, um, in, when he was in Newark, and then when he came back to Jersey uh, City Hospital. I saw him there. Um, and I'm glad I did. I haven't seen him since then, but I always wish that it would be another reconnection, and I knew there would be eventually. Um, I love the kid. He had a hard damn life, and, uh, you know, I saw him a lot more when he was young. He used to come to my house for weekends, and... You know, he did. He just wanted a lot of, he wanted attention. He wanted love. And, uh, you know, and we are all broken. It's so true. So I'm sure he's happy and peaceful now. Thanks. So everyone, this is, this is Steve's daughter, Miranda. And she wanted to share an experience that she had with her dad. Do you want to hold it for you? Hi, my name is Miranda. Um, and we were just talking about, what, it was the time you went out to eat? Yes. Yes. What do you want to tell them about it? Um, one time we went out for lunch, my mom said, you want to visit him? I'm like, yes, because I love my dad very much. And we went to this restaurant. I don't know what restaurant it was, but it was fun, though. We had just had lunch, and we ate. And um, we had cheesecake. And I'm like, he's like, what kind do you want? I'm like, you can pick. So he picked regular, and then we just shared. He's like, do you want any more? I'm like, no, nah, I'm fine, but thank you. Then we left. He's like, where do you want to go? I'm like, I don't know. Where do you want to go? And I'm like, we should go to the Sky Zone because it would be much fun. We have fun together. And he did like a bunch of flips. And I was surprised because I can't do that. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well. So um, we had to go. I was kind of sad, but at least we talked. And I was like, then I was home. I'm like, do I, do you have to go? He's like, yeah. And then we just hugged out and then he left. And then, but I know he loves you all and I know it's hard, but Stephen wants you all to make you smile and have a good life.
My name is David Webb. I'm a brother to Steve. I really took the moment and told every story about Steve and the things we've done, the good and the bad. We'd be here for a while. We wouldn't have jobs anymore. So we did share the same faith, and I know that he's up there with the Lord. And he would be saying, just point him to the Savior. Don't talk about me. Tell him about the Savior that I had. So, okay, Steve, so I will do that. The first century church, they would parade around their dead, and they would celebrate when a fellow believer died. The unbelievers were baffled and confused why they would do this thing. But what they didn't understand, the unbelievers didn't understand or felt it in their heart, was absent from the body is present with the Lord. They celebrated that death wasn't an, an exit. It wasn't, that's it, it wasn't over. It was an entrance into the finishing work of Christ that he accepted. I'm happy for Steve. Me and Steve had many long conversations about the battle of addiction, depression, many things that we walked the same roads together. Not long before he passed away, we had a conversation about those things. And he also told me his faith in Christ and his struggles. I would stay up late and we would have conversations. But Steve didn't go to bed saying, I got everything I needed completed. Okay, I accepted Christ. I'm going to get that mistake fixed. I'm going to finish school. I'm going to get things right with my parents. I'm going to get things right with my daughter, my son, with my family, with my job. He didn't. He went to bed thinking and taking for granted I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I got it tomorrow. Tomorrow's not granted. If you fell asleep and you didn't wake up, would you have regrets? Is your heart right? Is your heart pointing to the Savior? Life is short. It fades away. But the Savior I came, came to give us life and life to abundance. Not to put money in your pocket, not to take away your struggles, but to sit there in your financial struggles, to sit there in your struggles and give you the strength. The same God who created the world, the same God who created life, wants to give you life. And he died at his own cause. The life that we could not live, he lived in the life that we deserve to die. He died for us. It's not an easy walk. It's not roses and dandelions once you become a Christian. But you have the power. The same God who raises the dead wants to raise a new person in you. And he's done that in, in Steve. And I've seen it. I've seen the difference in Steve when he accepted Christ. I'm a man who walked that same road. I'm also a man that still struggle with my addictions. I'm a man who still struggles with my battles and my demons. But I'm here just to point everybody to the Lord. It's not about me. I think somewhere in the word it says, um, Oh, death, where is your sting? Christ has taken that sting. Call on him now while there's still time. Thank you for your time. Everybody, my name is Anna. Um, my sister Emily was Steve's fiance. Um, we never got an opportunity to meet the Webb family. Um, what I've seen here today makes me regret that very much because you are truly wonderful people. Um, we are all broken in our own different way. I don't suffer from some of the addiction issues that some people in this room do, but I've had a front row seat to that for quite some time now. Um, we also weren't particularly raised religious. Our faith is in our fellow man. And being in this room right now, I can very much feel that spirit is alive. And I know that Steve had so much energy and love. It actually made me kind of uncomfortable because I'm not that way. And I didn't know how to deal with it in the beginning. I'd only met him a couple times and it was just so intense, you know, like it's, Blech, all just right there on the table in front of you and take it or leave it, you know? And my sister took it um, because she has that a little bit too. And, 
you know, birds of a feather, and they were great. They complimented each other. They worked stuff out together. And um, I'm really sorry that we never got to see where that went. Um, but you guys really are wonderful. Um, I hope you realize that. And I know that he loved you guys a lot. Um, and you've got some sort of gift. I don't know if you're looking to get into ministry, but you are a great public speaker, and you should consider that, because um, that's not really my bag, and you impress me. So um, good job. But thank you, Marlon, for putting this together. Um, thank you for everyone in this room for coming. It's been a rough couple of weeks. I know that, probably for some of you more than others. Um, but yeah, y you all are really lucky people, and I hope that you realize how much love is out there for all of you. And um, thank you for having us. I'm not good at this at all. No. <laughs> um, but my name is AJ Webb, brother to Steve Webb. Uh, we're no angels, um, as our girlfriends, wives, father knows. Um, without me broken. I would tell you guys many stories but, um, about me, Steve, David, and Kenny, but there's a lot of law enforcement here, and I want to incriminate ourselves. <laughs> and I want to um, put my father's job in the line. Um, so I will tell you one story in particular. That, um, I was home. Um, Steve calls me. He's been missing for about an hour. I'm home in the maybe 2, uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. Calls me on the phone screaming, Hey, Johnny, help. Hey, Johnny, help. Like, what happened? I need help on running down the street Haunt Avenue. And I'm like, all right, here we go. So I see Steve's running down Haunt Avenue with no shirt. I'm running towards him in a car chasing after him. I end up finding out that um, he, he saw a gentleman punching a female and protecting the female. And he knew he wasn't going to win the fight, but he still stood up for that female. Um, Steve will jump into harm's way to protect you. Um, We've gone into battle many times. We wear the scars in our fists and our faces. And when we were together, we felt safe and protected. Um, one thing you say made you feel uncomfortable. I'm glad he made you feel uncomfortable in that way because he made us uncomfortable as always being naked for some type of reason. <laughs> I'm like, Steve, go put some clothes on, Steve. Please, Steve. Um, somebody say they felt safe around him all the time. Um, I felt safe 100%. Um, but when all four of us were sticking together, something was brewing, um, trouble was brewing, um, but we knew we had each other's back no matter what. Um, Steve was a, a broken angel. Uh, he had many demons to fight, just like we all do. None of us are perfect. Um, I'm glad Marlon was able to bring Steve into Christ. I'm glad the last conversation he had. I'm glad David was there when he needed for addiction. He never talked to me about addiction. I believe he was always trying to do, either trying to impress me or never wanted, never wanted me to know how bad he was doing. So I got a different conversation from Steve. I got the conversation from Steve that, hey, listen, I just stopped. I've been stopping for two weeks. I've been clean. I'm, I'm hanging in there. So I never got those conversations that my brother Dave got with him. So I'm thankful for him being there for him. Um, Kenny, thanks for being there with group homes. Uh, it was just you and him, back to back. Um, thanks for bringing him to our house. Thanks for allowing us to know him. Thanks for bringing his love to us. I love you, Steve. I'm sorry I had to take this to bring us together. But I know for a fact you got our backs. We gained an angel, a heavy hitter angel too. So I know we're protected. Love you, kid. So I'm uh, the infamous Kenny Webb. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, <laughs> oh boy, um, I don't don't know really where to start, and uh, trying to control my emotions here. <laughs> um, let's see. I met Steve at ERTC. Those of you who don't know who they, what it is is. Ewing Residential Boys Treatment Center for uh, 330 teenage, adolescent, raging hormones, alpha male boys. <laughs> At the time, I was probably, what, uh, 100, 
30 pounds, maybe, a, a ball of rage. And here comes this uh, tall, dark-skinned guy. He's going to tell me what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, and don't care about my responses about it. So, and that would be uh, my mentor at the time, Marlon Webb. This might be a little lengthy, so maybe not. Um, uh, huh? oh. um, so, eventually Steve comes along, and uh, Steve's little, sorry, white kid, <laughs> black hair. I got a room to myself. He's in Cottage 3, I'm in Cottage 3. So it's like, yo, intake, that means somebody new coming in. That means I got the available bed. That means he go, as Pat and Danny know, AKA milk, because he always drunk milk, but whatever. And it, Pat was always running around cussing people out because he was like 80 pounds, but like 5'3", but that's the way it was. And uh, Steve is like, yeah, uh, Vogel. And it's like, <clears throat> and this guy. So Steve comes in the room. And I got athlete's feet real bad at that time. Y'all probably remember. Real bad, like, real bad. So, like, he had to put the shoes outside the room and it still smelled the room up. But and Steve comes along and he's like, yeah, I got that side. Now, all my stuff's on that side. So, clearly, you have the side that's nothing, that's nothing there, right? So, Steve's like, yeah, well, I'm going to have that side. Now, I don't know him. And that's his humor. But I don't know his humor. And I take it as, you, you know, you trying to overdo me. And so... Me and Steve had our battles, but then it grew to liking him because uh, whether good, bad, or indifferent, Steve stood up regardless of, you know, how, what size you were at the program. It was Bloods and Crips and this and that. And Steve would just get into the mix with them, and it was like, Steve, uh, it's like six of them. It's, me, it's only me and you. Like, you, this is us on the bed of the middle of the night at ERTC. It's like, you can't do that, Steve. You got to relax. And then... Okay, I won't do it. The next morning, Pat would be running his mouth to somebody that was, you know, full mature. Thanks, Pat. And uh, me and Steve and go protect Pat because Pat's running his mouth and he's one of us. And eventually we got the 402 hunt and Dad really showed us um, love and how to stand up and choices and consequences. And then we met Shay, and, and then we met some of the other webs and they really stuck it to us, but they stuck it to us because... That was the way it had to be done. And nobody want to wrestle with, 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 uh, with, with Sean because he was like, you know, cock diesel. You want to mess with Shay because, you know, snap your fingers, she can make your heart stop because she was a nurse, you know, registered nurse. So, you know, we, we, all, we all grew into this family. And what I want to say is I appreciate everybody coming out here. I don't know um, everybody personally, but I know that Steve definitely 100% of the way was appreciative about everybody from start to finish. From the start, it was rough. From at the end, it was still rough, but Steve's love and the care of this family and what we all been through, from a brokenness to, to healing, to fighting, to not fighting, to I'm not a part of that family. Matter of fact, you don't have a choice, Steve. You're a part of the family, so we're gonna come get you, no matter where you, where you go, Steve, it doesn't matter. Well, I'm going to go down to Pat's house, or I'm going to Milk. All right, well, I'll be going to Jersey to go to Milk's house if you disappear too long. That's just the way it was. So um, I just appreciate everybody being here. And uh, to Milk and to Danny, well, Danny is Milk. So to Pat and Danny, we brothers, man. We all brothers. Okay, thank you. thing that I miss about Steve, I was nervous, um, look, the love he had for his family, not even us, but his true family, his father and mother, um, always spoke about them, always spoke about how he wants to get his family back together, mom and dad, I'm going to take my dad fishing, I'm going to be with my mom, I'm going to take her out, I'm going to take her to dinner, always mom and dad, always love, no matter what happened to his life, he had that love, um, he taught me that because I had to find love for my parents, so thank you Steve for that. How's everybody doing? This is definitely not my thing. I'm about to, I'm, I'm about to faint. No, I'm good. I'm just joking. 
Uh, me and Steve had a very similar sense of humor, as you can tell. Uh, you know, saying things that we don't mean, you know. But we really do mean it a little bit, in a joking way, you know. Um, behind every joke, there might be a little hint of truth. Um, me and Steve, I want to say we were good friends. Um, our daughters, crazy as it sounds, as close as we were, we grew apart at one point. Um, our daughters actually shared the same mother. Um, so because of that, it kind of held us together um, somewhat as well. Um, yeah, like I said, this is really not my thing. Um, but I do know that, uh, like everyone else has said, Steve woke up every day and just wanted to have the time of his life. And, you know, he instilled that in me and everybody else that he came around. And, I mean, I didn't really have that in me before. I was, you know, he's kind of given me the strength to stand up here at this point. Um, and you don't really realize this stuff until, you know, it's a little late. Um, but I just want to thank him for putting things into me and into my head that he probably might not even know that he did. Um, and I'm sure he's done it to each and every one of you. And, you know, um, we're just really blessed to, I guess, have him in our lives for the time that we did. And I love you, man. Hi, I'm Audrey, Pat's mom. The way Steve and I met um, was when Patrick went to Ewing Residential and we're walking in and this kid comes up and he starts acting like really tough around Pat, like trying to scare the crap out of him, excuse the language. And then he turns to me and he goes, ah, I'm just kidding, my name's Steve. I'll take care of your son, you don't have to worry. And he did. And when they got out, he came home with me and my son for a while. And then over the years, he would pop in and out. And like, you know, someone else, I don't remember who said, you know, he'd always be doing fine. He would never honestly say what was going on, what was hurting him. And then just, you know, I wouldn't hear from him for a year. And then out of the blue, I'd get this phone call. Hey, moms. You know, I'm in the neighborhood, you know, I want to take you out to lunch, something like that. And uh, I missed his last two calls, which I'll always regret now. But, God, I don't even know how long ago that was. Pat was 13 at the time. So he always called me moms, looked out for Pat for me. He was a good kid. He really was. He just wanted someone to love him. And I really miss him. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'm Clyde Scott, and I'm Steve's cousin. And I'm really proud to say that. Uh, Steve's a great guy. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm a self-conscious person, and I have problems with social anxiety, but <laughs> Steve didn't. <laughs> you know, Steve always, uh, he was comfortable anywhere he was. He was, he was accepting of it, and um, you know, he always had like this raw emotion you know, that, uh, that just made him okay, you know, and, uh, if I, uh, you know, if I were to take one thing, if I would be motivated by one thing, I would, it would be that. He was, he was confident in himself, no matter what, you know, but, uh, that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you all very much for all that you have shared. 
In a moment, I'm going to invite Marlon to come back up to say a few closing words, and then we'll have a final song. I, so much has been shared here today, personal, beautiful, and also the word of the Lord has been shared. Um, I think my brief contribution would be to read one verse, perhaps the most famous verse in the whole Bible, that makes the most important point in the world. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. <clears throat> Someone once said, some people think Jesus is useless. Some people think that Jesus is the most important thing in the world. But what no thinking person can ever think is that Jesus is only kind of important. Because if what this said is false, it doesn't matter at all. But if what this says is true, it's the most important issue in a person's life. Because all of us are only going to be on this earth a short time. And as a brother shared, we can go to bed tonight thinking we have tomorrow and we actually don't. We all have to appear before the judgment seat of God. And so, my dear friends, Yes, I'm sure Steve would want us to make sure we think about that and where we stand with God. The verse makes it clear, none of us is able to clean ourselves up so that we're worthy of God. We can never wait until I solve a few things in my life before I present myself to God. We're too broken for that. God says, I've already done it for you. And the righteousness you need is in my son Jesus. And the way it comes to your account is if you lean into him with a sincere trust in him. The way to get there, really, loved ones, is not complex, but it is profound. It's to have a conversation in your heart that goes something like this. Kind of like that phone call, that last phone call of Steve to Marlon. I'm sorry. You've given me so much, God. You've given me my life, my body, my family, my relationships. You've given me every morning and evening of my life. And I've wasted so much of it. And I knew you were there, but I kept pushing you away because I wanted to live life my way. But Lord, I've lived long enough now to realize you were right after all. And now I've come around the block, and now I realize that the only way to live a life that's worth living and to have a hope beyond this life is to come back to you. And so, Lord, I'm not worthy, but I see your arms are open. 
O Lamb of God, I come. Amen. Let that be the prayer of every hungry heart here this evening. Marlon, would you please come and make your final remarks, and then we will close our time together. This is my son, Gabriel. Hello. He said he was going to come up here today with me, so I wouldn't be scared. <laughs> and so thank you, Gabe. Yeah, so um, whatever you heard about Marlon Webb that sounded like it was something good when people were saying that Marlon Webb did something good, I want you to know that there's not much good in Marlon Webb. It's the Jesus that you see if it's good. Marlon Webb's just a person. I'm broken. Got my own stuff to deal with, quite honestly. But when I put it, um, I hold my own sin and issues up to the light and they become transparent and there's this Savior who's allowed me to do some extraordinary things through the power that he gives me um, that's what you're seeing so don't be mistaken I'm just I'm a simple guy I'm a broken guy who knows where to get fixed who knows who to go to to get fixed um, so I'm sad because so many people are sad in here that's that's making me sad I'm not sad um, for losing Steve I'll miss Steve but um, I know Steve's in a better place I'm sure Steve's in a better place um, he run, and David said he's running around naked. And it's true. Because if you knew Steve, like trying to get him to keep his clothes on. Steve was always taking, like, Steve, can you put your, you put your clothes on? <laughs> House full of teenagers, right? Everybody's wrestling, throwing each other around or whatever. I come home, got to take off my gun, put it in the safe. And I'm like, all right, here we go. And it's like WrestleMania, furniture broken, all sorts of stuff, right? And we're, everything broken up, walls, holes in walls, everything like that. I'd probably get lots of diapers referrals for the way that we lived. And then here comes Steve running down the stairs and jump out and he's naked. And I'm like, um, nobody wants to wrestle anymore, Steve. Like we're, we're good. Everybody's good. Please put your, put your clothes on. You win. You win. You win. Sorry. Had to throw that out there. <laughs> we're in church. Otherwise the picture right there would be Steve with no clothes on. Cause that's it. That's what he would have. That was a Steve in front of the curtain. Now behind the curtain, you know, different guy. I want to read you a scripture. Um, I want to describe a scripture to you. Matthew 9, 36. Um, Jesus is with his disciples, and when he sees the people who are there, um, he says this. He says, uh, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And that's the way that I felt about Steve when I saw him, like harassed and helpless, and he needed somebody um, to follow. And I wasn't somebody good to follow. I was just following Jesus so he could come with me, and we could both follow Jesus together. But the next part, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so what did Jesus tell his disciples to do? He didn't say, well, um, because I'm Jesus and I'm all powerful, right? I'm just going to take all these people and I'm going to heal them right now. I can do this right now. No problem, because that's Jesus. I'm paraphrasing. No disrespect intended to the word of God. Um, but Jesus could have done all that. He had the ability to do that. But what he did is he told them to harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So you, disciples, pray to the Lord of the harvest, God, um, to send workers into his harvest field. Listen, we can't do everything for everybody. We can't hold everybody up all on our own. We can't do that. God might give us some people to love on and to help and to work with, and that's great. But when you run across somebody who you feel like it might be too difficult to love on them, it might be, it just doesn't fit for you. It might be too tough. Listen, God didn't say you have to save everybody. He already sent a savior to do that. He sent you to love people. So what he told them to do was to pray to the Lord of the harvest, to send someone. So you can't help the person on your right or your left because they're drowning, and that's a little bit too much for you. It's as easy as a prayer. God doesn't need you to do it, but he sure can send somebody to do it, but have the heart enough to love somebody. Say a prayer for that person, if you can. Say a prayer. It'll work. It's working. Um, so, for my young people, there's a song I play all the time. I'm not, I can't really carry a tune too much. Well, that, the, I didn't say that in front of the web family. I can sing. 
so the Webb family knows I ain't trying to say I can't sing. I'm part of new wine. The old wine can't sing. I can sing. I'm being transparent. I'm, you know, I'm not great at holding the tune, but I love the music that praises God or reminds me of things. So in the middle of the night, one night, I'm working an overnight at work, and I hear this song come on the radio, and when I hear it, it is exactly the words I would say to my young people. Exactly. So I play it for Gabe in the morning. I play it for all my kids. I send it to everybody who's hurting. I send it to the people I love when I want them to understand something. So I just want to play this song for you because it is so important. It is just so important. And um, so after that song, we're going to move on and close out. And, and thank you. That's all that I have to say. But I really appreciate you coming out to honor Steve's life. I really, really appreciate it. God bless you. In Jesus' name. up a pen and a page And I started writing just what I'd say If we were face to face I'd tell you just what you mean to me Tell you these simple truths Be strong in the Lord and never give up hope You're gonna do great things So don't live life in fear Forgive and forget But don't forget why you're here Take your time and pray These are the words I would say Last time we spoke You said you were hurting And I felt your pain to tell you and I keep on praying love will find you where you are I know cause I've already been there so please hear these simple truths be strong in the Lord and never give up hope you're gonna do great things I already know God's got his hand on you so don't live life in fear Forgive and forget But don't forget why you're here Take your time and pray These are the words I would say From one simple life to another I will say Come find peace in the Father Do great things I already know God's got his hand on you So don't live life in fear Forgive and forget But don't forget why you're here Take your time and pray Let's praise the Lord together with now with an applause, shall we? <laughs> Loved ones, as we close, would you please stand and we're going to sing the song in Christ alone, in Christ alone, because that is our hope. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love 
ones, it's been a sweet time together. I wanted to let you know that this coming Sunday here at Columbus Baptist at 10 a.m. at our worship service, we're going to be dedicating the service to Stephen. If you do not have a home church, we invite you to worship with us on that day. Also, we'd like to invite you to join us for some good food to eat right now. And we're going to leave this place, and the food is served in the old original building. You know, you just go out these doors, turn left, and walk toward the original building. Or if you want to hop in your car and get closer to it, you can. It is uh, handicap accessible. And uh, so, Marlon, I would say for you and the family, as we close, Marlon, would you and the family please lead the way and just head right out and head down. And family, let's, let's follow them, please, down there. And um, that would be very timely if we could do so. May God's blessings be on you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. <laughs>